Greetings, this is Dr. Strebik, and in this lecture we're going to talk about natural resources and sustainability and look at an example that illustrates the interface between those natural resources, the economy involved with those natural resources, and the societal effects when those economic resources are sometimes abused. So if we think about sustainable design, one of the things we'd like to do in this class is define what sustainable design in engineering means. So the way we've described it in the textbook is that it's the design of products and also processes or systems that balance the belief in both the sanctity of human life and promote and enable the environment for people to enjoy for long, healthy, and creative lives while protecting and preserving these natural resources for both their intrinsic value and the natural world's value to humankind, including future generations. When we think about sustainable development, the idea is that we're not maximizing uh, the environmental benefits, maximizing economic benefits, or maximizing societal benefits, but we're seeking a balance of all three as shown in the left-hand figure, which discusses is sometimes called the, the three pillars or the triple bottom line associated with sustainability that considers environmental, economic, and societal impacts. Another diagram that illustrates sustainability is that the environment uh, encompasses all of society and the economy because the environment provides for societal needs uh, society is what drives the economy and that the economy is actually the smallest of these issues and the economy is reliant both on uh, societal health and environmental health in order to have a vibrant economy so that the economy is actually the smallest of the the three uh, pillars so these are just different ways to consider sustainability and sustainability models. I'm not necessarily promoting that one is right and one is wrong, but there are different ways to view sustainability. But these most definitions encompass environmental society and economic manifestations of the definition. So as we think about the environment and the natural resources that the environment provides, the environment provides both renewable and non-renewable resources. So non-renewable resources can be things that are non-regenerative in our typical human life scale, such as coal, natural gas, oil, and also fossilized water, which is buried deep aquifer water that has been buried for geologic timescales. So our coals, natural gases, and oils often come from fossilized algae that comes from millions of years ago. And again, based on our human time span, is non-regenerative. There are also things that are theoretically recoverable. So water can be reused and can be recovered. And things like aluminum can be used, but can also be reused and recovered even from waste processes. So then there are things like metals, uh, and I use the example of aluminum, probably a better example in the theoretical recoverable uh, minerals and metals would be things like gold and platinum. Very high precious, what we call precious metals because of their cost per weight. That even in when disposed of in uh, low concentrations are recoverable because of their high price. Recyclable things like steel and and aluminum are examples of metals and also plastics, as well as water. And then there are things that are regenerative, things that can recover like soil, surface water, and groundwater. Renewable resources might include things that to our scales are essentially infinite, such as solar energy, eventually in um, billions or, or trillions of years that the sun is expected to lose its thermal energy. But for our human time scales, solar energy is infinitely available. That solar energy drives things like wind energy, tidal and wave energy as well. There are also large amounts of air and water on the planet, and those are mostly non-consumable. So we consume water, but it goes back into that water hydraulic cycle. 
than things that are regenerative or things that are replenished but grow on a basis that is comparable to human time scales. These are things like vegetation and forests, fish in the ocean, things like surface water use and groundwater use. So as we look at the use of these resources, we want to consider the rate of use and how that rate of use can, relates to the regenerative capacity of things that are recyclable or renewable. So those natural resources then provide a basis, as we've said, for many of society's needs and often drive economic portions within the, the society. So natural resources or ecosystems can provide what's known as cultural services, regulating services, and provisioning services. Cultural services are those things that don't necessarily have economic uh, value per weight or per mass of a material, but instead provide societal benefits such as uh, recreation and tourism, aesthetic appeal for reducing stress level, uh, educational value, and providing a sense of place and, and cultural heritage as well that's important to many societies. Regulatory services, services are things within the ecosystem that provide for the basic society and civilization that's grown around humankind. So our cities demand water, so water is needed, provided on a regular basis to provide for those civil societies. As was discussed earlier in the textbook, in the uh, Ogallala Aquifer, that's water limitations may change how societies respond. Going back to Chaco Canyon and early Native American cultures, the change in climate likely resulted in a change of the society as well. Because those regulating services, water was no longer available. So in our human lifetimes, we often see instances of drought or flooding that have significant changes on society. These, of course, also include things like climate regulation, disease regulation and spread of disease, and things like pollination of plants that allow food production. Which gets us to the other category, provisioning services. So these are products with oftentimes economic value that are provided by the ecosystem. So we've discussed water availability, also things like fuel wood and wood for building, biochemicals, genetic resources, and of course, food provisionings. And then in addition to the cultural regulating and provisioning services, there are also ecosystem services that support those broader systems above. And those include things like uh, significant natural rates of erosion, which provide for soil formation across land, which provides for uh, the cultural and regulatory services related to food and growth and forests. Nutrient cycling, such as nitrogen and phosphorus throughout the system, which again provides for forest growth, pollination, food production, uh, wood production, and other issues, and then primary production of these systems as well. So the microorganisms and how they de degrade and break down wastes in the environment. So all these ecosystems have intrinsic value to our society. Intrinsic meaning things that don't necessarily have a monetary value, but are recognized as having value to most of human civilization. More recently, we've put effort into defining the actual value, economic value, of many of these ecosystem services. And that can be explored further through Canvas. So the United Nations has put targets for pervert preserving various life support systems, such as water, nitrogen oxide cycling in terms of air quality, ocean uh, preservation measures to preserve both water quality within the ocean, but also fish production, and then species and ecosystem targets for whales, moratoriums on whale harvesting for many countries in 1986 through the International Whaling Commission, uh, sustainable fishing guidelines, migratory bird 
uh, protections in biodiversity conservation areas to protect important biodiverse areas within the, the continent. So while measures have been passed, there have also been some failures. And one of the examples, historical examples, I'd like to take you to uh, today is to talk about the Aral Sea crisis and what's happening in South Central Asia. So the Aral Sea is located in Central Asia between the southern part of Kazakhstan and northern Uzbekistan. And up until the third quarter of the 20th century, it was the fourth largest saline lake and contained 10 grams of salt per liter. So relatively low salt content, but a, not a freshwater lake. And it was a very, very large system. It was fed by two rivers, the Amudara and the Sirdara rivers, that respectively reached the sea through the north and the southern directions. In the 1960s, the Soviet Union decided to divert those rivers for irrigation in other areas surrounding the Aral Sea, favoring agricultural and economic production rather than supplying water to the Aral Sea Basin. The result of that is a huge change in the Aral Sea area and the change in that Aral Sea has had impacts on both the water issues obviously the surrounding supportive ecosystem services that that provides particularly in terms of fish production that was a basis for the economy in those societies surrounding the Aral Sea. So the drying up of this sea area had a huge impact on the local area but there was a benefit in providing some irrigated development around the Aral Sea but a significant loss of income and change in society measures around the Aral Sea itself. This graphic, I'm sorry, is a little blurry, but you can see in the maroon, the darkest uh, color on the top map, was the extent of the Aral Sea around the 1960s prior to using the water for irrigation. It has continued to shrink showing in the kind of brown band 1977 shrinking farther going back through the decades kind of the orangish color shrinking to the level of 1987 1997 shrinking to the orange color and shrinking to the 2000 color where the arrow sea is significantly decreased in size over the years and continues to decrease into the 2020s so we see here that the water withdrawal comes from both the Anudara and the Sirdara rivers and has increased substantially from flow generation into Tzikistan, Kyrgyzstan, and Uzbekistan, limiting the amount of water that's available with large amounts of abstraction from the Aral Sea Reservoir in Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, and Turkmenistan. Because this is a multinational issue of water withdrawal, the water withdrawal doesn't make it to the Aral Sea. And here we see a picture and a satellite photos of the drying of the Aral Sea up until 2009, about 10 years ago. And you can see the salty soil left behind in the white uh, soil area left from the salt deposits of the dried up Aral Sea over this time. So what I'd like to do is take a moment, turn you over to a YouTube channel where we'll actually take a trip virtually on YouTube to the Aral Sea and see what it looks like today or in recent times after removal of this groundwater and how removal of the groundwater changing the ecosystem services that were provided significantly impact both the economy and society surrounding the Aral Sea region. 